Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with veteran California-based jazz pianist Dan Siegel. He opened up about his new 2021 CD, Far Away Place, COVID, his life in music, and hope for the future. On his latest effort, he constructed this while the coronavirus wreaked havoc to a deadly extreme, creating a double-edged sword for musicians. Many were silenced while others were aroused to be creative in their artistic expression. This gifted musician was born in Seattle, Washington, and raised in Eugene, Oregon. He's got a cachet of great stories, so enjoy. Joe Domino, Neon Jazz Radio. How you doing, Joe? What's going on? Just trying to figure out uh, what I'm going to do today with my life. <laughs> well, that's half the battle. Well, hey, thanks for taking a minute out. Maybe this will get you in the right direction. Sure. Well, that's good. I needed I needed some direction. <laughs> <laughs> we all need it sometimes. Well, hey, man, first and foremost, thank you for taking a minute out. And I want to talk about Far Away Place. And obviously, the architecture of this conversation would have been different about, I don't know, three, four weeks ago when it seemed like things were kind of heading in a better direction. But this album comes out. It's coming out during a pandemic. Talk to me a little bit about your feelings on this coming out during this particular time. You know, I started started writing um, actually probably, oh, you know, 2000, end of 2018, I started compiling various ideas. You know, as, as it takes with whenever you start writing, you never know where things are going to go and it, and and it uh, a lot of the the songs are kind of um it, they come from different places and and as you know the whole pandemic thing came down it was it became problematic in trying to like you know document it and record it i started recording uh last year 2020 in the very beginning of um of november and a lot going on you know you know, including the pandemic, but that was right before the election. And I won't go into politics, but it was pretty, a person from my perspective anyway, most of the people that I know, you know, it was pretty frightening, you know, before and after. So when we fe- we scheduled the first, I had the first, this is sort of maybe something we won't talk about or you won't talk about, but I had this, the first session booked for November 2nd, I think, which was the day before the election, one of the drummers, I won't say who, but he just he goes, man, he goes, we should wait to do the session after the Civil War, and he wouldn't he wouldn't come into town in L.A. and record on uh, November second, and so I ended up kind of having two drum sessions that you know that happened at different times, and um, you know on top of the pandemic, and you know it's been a, a, a kind of scary and and um, just you know a strange time for everybody and the way this this uh, record was recorded was um you know kind of uh, that that was the only session the drum the two drum sessions were the only ones that i was present at and everything else was recorded virtually meaning i sent demos of all the parts and everybody recorded in their home studios and laid down their parts and then sent them to me and the engineer and so just the process of of recording was problematic and more challenging from different directions, one being the technical side of things because you have to trust people that, you know, maybe they're great players but they're not good engineers and that's kind of a that's a different hat to wear, you know, and making sure they know where to put the microphone, how to set the mic preamp and making sure they get the sample rate and the bit depth correct, which, you know, is all that stuff is it becomes uh, important. And so it's that whole element. And, you know, if you're an old guy like me that you're used to recording sitting together in the studio and hanging out with the guys, I mean, that's probably, you know, that's half the fun of it, you know, just kind of, you know, you don't see these guys more than every once every few years. And, and that aspect was, you know, missing. And I think, I mean, we could all say that in all of our lives, you know, I mean, uh, I haven't worn a collared shirt in, in like a year and a half. I, I think I put one on and said, why am I wearing this? I'll put on a T-shirt because I don't go anywhere and I don't see anybody, you know. Um, and I think we're all kind of, you know, missing that. And, and hence, you know, as things develop, that became sort of the focus of the record is that, you know, I'm just thinking, and, you know, and it's still in the, it's not getting better. As you said, it's, it's, uh, we're still in the midst of it. I wish we could say that it's, uh, it's going in the right direction, but it's uh, you know this this thing is going to be with us for a while. So 
anyway. Yeah, no, I, I get it. I totally do. Let's kind of flash forward to the beginning of your life. How did you get the jazz bug? How did you get into music? How did this begin for you? I started out uh, being a musician when I was, you know, pretty young, I guess. I was 12, you know, and one of the motivations was that uh, my brother had a guitar, my older brother, and um, I used to pick up his guitar and kind of try to play a few chords on it. And one of the, the main motivations was that I remember I was, uh, I think I was uh, 11 or something, and he, he grabbed the guitar out of my hands and he said, you will never be any good at this. And that was kind of like the, my relationship with my older brother <laughs> for my whole life. He, he smelled it out a little bit, but so I said, you know, I said to myself, I'm going to figure out how to do this. So um, I started playing guitar in a band and, you know, had a band. Uh, we were making, playing Y dances and, you know, we'd make, I think, you know, but split between four of us, uh, you know, $50 for a, a, a YMCA dance, which was huge money in, you know, the 60s. You know, I did that and ended up then, you know, getting a gig in a bigger and better band and kind of been always been in a band. Um, and, you know, I never, you know, who thinks career when you're young right i mean you just if it's working and you just do it just because it was uh it was fun i mean who doesn't love music and playing music and you know if you're a, a, a short dopey dude like me you know and and all of a sudden girls want to talk to you because you play an instrument here on the stage it's like man i think i'm going to continue to do this uh, it has benefits way beyond just the you know the spiritual and, and musical side of things so I never got really the support from my my father who he had a cousin who was a a jazz musician in the 50s I guess and he, you know became a heroin addict and kind of you know disappeared from the family and so my father's concept of a musician especially a jazz musician was not positive and he tried to encourage you know myself and my two brothers to get into business you know of course who wanted to do that we all rejected his his ideas and um, so he he just pretty much said you know you know you, you shouldn't become a musician and and of course it's like uh, you know it's like once that once you get hooked on it it's it's like a a disease you know there's really no cure and if you can you know survive and and do it you you're gonna pursue that until you can't do it anymore and I guess I've just been lucky enough to just here I am you know I'm I'm 67 years old and I'm. I'm still doing it, you know, not as putting them out as as often uh, as I, I used to. But, you know, when I have something to say, I I, I do it and I, I have the luxury to be able to do that. So um, it's kind of been my my existence uh, and, and, you know, musically since the beginning. So what was the first live show you saw that really blew your doors down and made you think, man, that's something I'd love to do? This is kind of a, a actually an aside to the previous question as well is that I was always into kind of you know the, whatever the the influences that that happen for most young people you're kind of drawn to whatever popular music was when I was 18 I had a friend in high school that gave me four records for my 18th birthday he gave me Chick Corea now he sings now he sobs Maiden Voyage Herbie Hancock. Uh, what else did he give me? The Bill Evans record, which was, I think, you know, uh, the solo record. Not solo, but with this trio, Waltz for Debbie, that kind of stuff. And then he gave me a, uh, God, he, it was a Tony Williams record, a Lifetime record that was pretty out there. I listened to Now He Sings, Now He Sobs every day for probably about three years. And same, you know, Bill Evans and Herbie were like, those three people were like my main influences. I said, these guys are just fabulous like you know if i could just you know capture two percent of what they know and try to figure out how to play like them i you know that would be i i I, w I could die happy and on my 19th birthday i, I never get he get loaned those records to me and on my 19th birthday i gave him back the tony williams record and i said this is too out but i'm keeping the others and he goes okay well that's your 19th birthday present uh, and, you know, those records were were in incredibly important. I ended up um, moving to Boston, I think, uh, in 1975, which I went to Berkeley for one week, and it was kind of a rigid uh, program, and I I dropped out of school, but I was surrounded by all these just these, these fabulous players, and, and you know, I'd look through the practice room windows and listen to these guys playing these bebop lines going, crap, you know, I need to practice more, you know. 
I'm never going to be as good as that guy, you know. And so um, that was kind of the goal in those days was uh, to try to, to establish and, and improve your craft to where you could um, – you could you could get by, or you wouldn't embarrass yourself if you went to a, a, a jazz jam session and they called a tune that you know with difficult changes or something. You know, those were the goals in those days. Um, I ended up getting evicted out of my apartment, which was a really kind of a funny story. Uh, and I ended up back on the West Coast and I finished school. I had an opportunity actually to uh, study piano with Bill Evans. This is a, just such a crazy, ironic story. I was I was. I had to get a job because my father, who didn't support me being a musician, uh, cut me off. And he just said, you know, if you're like you're living out there and you want to be a musician, you can do it yourself. And of course, 1975 was a was a uh, a really bad recession in the United States. I got a job working at the at a department store, Jordan Marsh, for two dollars and fifty cents an hour. And of course, that wasn't enough. My take home pay in a, you know a week was. Um, like fifty five dollars or something, and it was so I couldn't pay my my rent. Uh, barely had enough to eat, and I was one day I was like in my break from I worked in the handbag department, and the you know it was what a wacky thing. But um, I was standing, I went down to a record store that was down downtown Boston, and I'm looking at the new Bill Evans record, and I'm going, geez, I loved, you know, but I, I can't afford this. I can't even remember how much vinyl records were in those days, but this guy just walks up to me and he goes, do you like Bill Evans? And I said, yeah. And he goes, here's his phone number. <laughs> and so he gives me Bill Evans' phone number. And so like, I, wow. I went home and I sat there. I think, uh, you know, I waited for about two days. And then after a couple of days, I got up to courage. I called, but I hung up like twice. You know, a woman answered and I hung up. And then I called back and I hung up again. I was too afraid. I think it was like the third time I finally got the courage to like say, uh, uh, uh. Anyway, I started talking to her and I said, look, I just, this is really random, but I, I was in a record store and uh, I got this number and I said, I'm a huge Bill Evans fan. And does he give piano lessons? And she, you know, we talked and we ended up talking for like 45 minutes, which is then his then wife, who was pregnant with his only child that he ever had. She goes, well, you know, I'm, you know, eight months pregnant or something. And she goes, well, I'm from San Francisco. And, and I said, well, I'm from Eugene, Oregon. And she goes, well, we're just from the same area. And I was just like, we are? Okay, I'll go with that, you know. And she went on and on. And she says, I can't guarantee you that he'll take you on as a student. She goes, but I can guarantee you he'll give you one lesson. That's all I can guarantee you. If you can come down to New York, I'll, I'll guarantee you one lesson. She goes, call back tomorrow night. And I'll we'll schedule it. And so I hung up the phone and I was like, "Oh my God, you know, I got a piano lesson with Bill Evans." About an hour later, the landlord knocks on the door, and you know, I see him outside, and he was drunk because we had I hadn't paid the rent for like a month and a half. He was drunk and he had a gun, and he had the keys to the apartment, and we had like three locks. We lived in a crappy area there in Boston, and. He opens the door, and I'm like sitting there, and he goes, you got eight hours to get out of here. And he's waving this gun, and he's like half drunk. And I'm like, okay, okay, you know, I got my stuff together, which wasn't much. I ended up knocking on the door of a, a guitar player that lived down the hall. I stayed in his place one night, and the next day I took a plane home. And I never got to call back and get my lesson with Bill Evans, which was wow. Heartbreaking, right? Yeah. But, you know, Man. I think about that. Yeah, what a story. I mean, the, just the whole thing. It's like the, the random chance for that to even happen. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Well, it was and, just, yeah, bizarre. Yeah. Well, and I guess speaking of bizarre stories and scripts, you know, you have quite a history in TV and film. And I'm always fascinated with musicians that get to this point because you get such a wide audience. And you actually get paid money for it. What is it like to be able to do that line of work with being a musician? It's a, it's a interesting observation because you know you think of you know making music to just for music's sake without any constraints is you know like making records. It's great. It's total freedom. Making music that has to go with along with media that's just supporting say a, a storyline or dialogue or picture is a completely subservient process and it's completely different really 
fun and interesting, but can be challenging in its own way. And it took me a little while to learn that. Um, and most of the gigs that I got doing, you know, TV and film, that people just call me and say, "Hey, we really like this song, or we like this music. We want you to, you know, do some music for this film or whatever." I I learned a lot in the process, meaning that you know, I, I realized that the music has to completely depend on whatever the director's vision of his film is, not what you think it is. And um, honestly, I almost got fired from several projects for, you know, being young and um, and too honest. You know, there was the, you know, the, the film. There was a film that I worked on that where there was a scene that I wrote I thought was a great cue, and he says, "No, this needs to be serious." I said, but "This is hilarious. This is such tongue-in-cheek sort of bad horror. You know, we need to like play this as a comedy." And, you know, I remember after that, that conversation, he called my manager at the time, and he goes, get this guy off my film. He doesn't know what he's, he, he doesn't agree with my, you know, my perspective. And he had to talk me, talk the guy into, you know, keeping me on, which I did, but, you know, I learned to, like, keep my mouth shut at that time. But um, it's a lot of fun, and it can be really exciting, but um, at the pressure is like, you know, you, you're working usually, if you're doing TV, episodic TV is like, um, you know, you got like four days to write. And then uh, things have changed now in that everybody's working at home, you know, with with uh, their sample libraries and everybody's recording virtually and flying files back and forth, which you can do. Um, you know, in the old days, you'd, if you had the budget, you'd, you'd go to, to one of the music studios on the lots and you know, Paramount or Warner or Sony or whatever, and, um, you know, you'd hire 15, 20 people and a small orchestra, and you'd sit there and you'd r record it, and the music would be done in, you know, three or four hours, and, and you'd go home and write the next week. So um, there's a schedule to it that some people take to and some people don't, but um, it's a completely different process, you know, and, and I always thought that whenever I was working on TV and film, I said, man, this is a rat race. I'd I'd rather just go make a record. It's so much more fun, and you don't have to deal with all these personalities and you know all these deadlines. And then when I would be making records for, I think, yeah, I kind of missed you know working in that structured environment. And and working in film is is such a collaborative medium. It's 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 so great because there's so many people, so many creative people that are you know working on it. And by the time it's all done, it's kind of quite a you know monument of all that cooperation and. And technology and, and expertise. It's kind of it's cool, you know. You know, everyone has a perception of who they think you are: your family, your friends, your fans. But ultimately, you live your life. You have a perception of you. Who do you think you are? Jeez, um, I try not to think about that. Um, I, I think, <laughs> you know, I've always just felt really, really lucky to be able to to do to make music, you know, because it's a uh, you know, it's meaningful to, and, and I think sometimes when when certain fans reach out to me and say, you know, this song or this record or something, it's really just moved me or, you know, we got married, we walked down the aisle to this song and I'm like thinking, really? You know, and there are times when I look at the music as just being sort of something you create and you move on to the next thing, but I'm a fan of music and, you know, I can think of a number of artists that I've listened to that I've, songs that have I've associated with certain periods in my life that, you know, music is really important. It, it's it's such a gift in a way. And um, I sometimes take it lightly and then I'm reminded by people that, you know, how important it is. And, and, and you know, not from an egotistical standpoint, but that, you know, even the music that I create means something to other people. And so, I you know, I, I have to remind myself to, like, take the music I take it seriously when I'm creating it, but then afterward I kind of just, you know, walk away from it. Um, that's important, you know, it's a responsibility in a way, and, and I, I've kind of gotten beyond, you know, worrying about like, well, is this going to, is anybody going to even like this, or is it commercial, or, you know, I don't even think about that anymore. I just create it, and I think, you know, I've kind of found a voice of somewhere in between, you know, you know, the smooth jazz people don't like me because, you know, I have too many chords, and and the straight ahead people, you know, don't like me because I don't swing. And, you know, so it's like, you know, I don't I don't go jang, jang, a lang, dang, a dang. You know, I like straight eighth notes, you know. So, yeah, I kind of just found my my place 
in, in the musical world, and, and it, for better or worse, that's where I am. I'm, you know, so I'm, I'm reasonably comfortable there, you know, and I, you know, people say, well, it doesn't do this or it's that or, you know, it's like whatever it is what it is. Um, I think what gives me the most gratification is that I'm teaching. You know, I'm a teacher. I've been a teacher for about 20 years. Um, and it's in, in, a, in a small school. I teach my students everything I know. And, of course, after 10 minutes, I don't have much to say. But I, I give them life lessons in the music world that took me decades to learn. That, to me, is probably the most meaningful thing that I that I do. And so I kind of, between the balance of being able to make music and, and trying to pass on uh, as much of the knowledge as that I've learned, because there's a lot to learn, you know, and the, the musical, the business has changed so much in the last, you know, 20 years, and you got to keep up with those changes. And I, I like to think that the potential and the possibilities have improved from when I was coming up, you know, in the 80s or, or the 90s, where the you know, only way you could have a voice in this industry was that you, if you got signed to a, a record label. And um, now anybody can do it. And, that you know, that, that there are positives and negatives to that, and that a lot of music, you know, probably shouldn't come out that does. It's not very well conceived or performed or whatever, but still that possibility of if you create something of value that there will it will find an audience and um that's you know I'm optimistic about that and and I try to as long as is the the students my students understand you know all of the requirements that go along with that from copyright to performance rights and they understand how to you know get compensated for you know their work I think it's a it's a great time to be a, a musician, but you know on the negative side of things is that you know if you are a, an up and coming musician these days, you know, and you're sitting at home in your little home studio, you, you're the engineer, you're the producer, you're the artist, and then when you finish it, you're also the manager and the agent, and you have to take on all of these jobs in the beginning. And if you want to get signed to a record company, they're not going to sign you until you've got some kind of a fan base. So you have to get kind of it's the old catch twenty two. How do you get to get the gig? You know, you got to get the experience. Well, how do you get the experience without getting the gig? You know, and so um, there's so much to learn, and it's pretty it's, you know overwhelming for for young people to kind of get their heads around all of those things. But that's the, that's what where we live right now. You know, so and now that we're all you know, secluded and again, and you know, you can't go out and hang with people, and you, you know, even recording sessions are problematic. You know, everybody is sitting at home doing everything um, themselves. You know, and it's one of the things that I like to try to tell my students is that you know, it's never going to be more fun than when you're sitting in a in a room with other players. And hanging out and making music, you know, that's as good as it can get. Um, some of the most just, you know, positive and um, just great feelings that I've ever achieved are like sitting in a studio making music with people and watching something that's just like our notes on the page come to life and actually turn into something meaningful. And, you know, a lot of the students are that I deal with are, you know, sitting at home on their laptops and they miss that communal experience, which, you know, I try to convince them that, you know, if you can't, if you're not a guitar player, hire a guitar player, you know, hire a bass player. And, you know, everybody's like, well, you know, I'll just do it myself or I'll use a sample. It's like, ah, but, you know, I mean, it's not the real thing, you know, hire, you know, it's like so much better with, the, with the, if you hire somebody that's practiced their instrument and, you know, knows their their craft man that's a great answer that's a great way to wrap everything up man hey thank you dan for taking some time out today for neon jazz good luck with everything i appreciate it okay thanks a lot for the call joe thanks for listening and tuning in to another neon jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in california kansas city and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz thanks to dan for his time music and cool if you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends.
Neon Jazz.